Dear ladies and gentlemen, let, let us start our uh, online meeting. Uh, first of all, uh, let me first extend our best uh, wishes to our friends and uh, colleagues in attendance. Thank you for coming to listen and take part in our discussion on the ways uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is impacting the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative in Central Asia. My name is Ermek Baisalov. I'm the editor of uh, analytical platform Kabar.Asia. Uh, today, I will serve as a moderator of this event, along with my colleague, uh, Nargiza Muratalieva. Uh, first, let me brief you, briefly tell about our uh, analytical uh, platform, the Central Asian uh, Bureau of Analytical Reporting, which we uh, shortly call uh, Kabar.Asia, uh, platform which is uh, mean to uh, provide uh, a forum for discussing and uh, reflecting on the uh, critical uh, political processes in the Central Asian region. At Kabar Asia, we uh, are interested in understanding not only the positions and uh, assessments of regional actors, uh, uh, but also those uh, of uh, international experts and organizations. Uh, Kabar.Asia is a project of the Institute of, uh, for War and Peace uh, Reporting, IWPR. It's an international network of uh, organizations which works in uh, 28 countries worldwide. So today um, at this meeting, uh, there is a leadership of our organization in the person of Mr. Uh, Anthony Borden. Uh, he's a IWPR executive director. And uh, Mr. Abahon Sultan Azarov, uh, Regional Director of uh, IWPR in Central Asia. And also with us today, uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Ole Bjornoy, uh, the Norwegian Ambassador to Central Asia. Uh, I would like to take this uh, opportunity and uh, to, to thank the government of uh, Norway for the opportunity to hold this meeting and uh, to support the, our activities. So as you already know, the topic uh, of uh, this meeting is the implementation of the Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative in the con context of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Today we will consider uh, issues such as uh, how the geopolitical changes can influence the uh, Belt and Road Initiative in Central Asia and uh, how the Chinese economic uh, ties influence the economic situation in Central Asia. Uh, is it uh, relevant to compare the political regimes in response to the pandemic? And uh, what are the new tools can, you, can uh, China use to promote its uh, soft power? So um, to this end, we have gathered an online forum today with an international contingent. We are greatly pleased to present uh, this panel, uh, which includes Mr. Uh, Arne Elias Carneliusen, the founder of and director of NRC, the Norwegian Risk Consulting International, a geopolitical risk advisory. Also, uh, Dr. Catherine Owen, uh, who is a British Academy postdoctoral uh, fellow and uh, lecturer in international relations at the University of Exeter. And Dr. Raman Vakulchuk, a senior research fellow at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Uh, together with these uh, international experts, we have the representatives of the Central Asia, uh, Mr. Anton uh, Bugayenka uh, the, from Kazakhstan, uh, who is a chief uh, expert uh, of the Chinese and Asian Studies program at the uh, Institute of uh, World uh, uh, Economics and Politics. And uh, Mr. Timur Umarov uh, from uh, Uzbekistan, who is a uh, Sinologist, uh, yeah, aspiring sinologist and a specialist in Central Asia uh, and who works as a consultant and a contributor to the Carnegie Moscow Center. So uh, let me uh, say a few words about the technical aspects of the today's meeting. Our discussion uh, is divided into four thematic uh, sessions. Each session has one uh, or two keynote speakers as well as a couple uh, commenters. The report uh, takes uh, 10 minutes and the comment uh, is uh, two, three minutes. One session lasts an average of 50 minutes. 
Uh, after these sessions, we will have a, a Q&A session, which will be in the end of the meeting. Uh, so the, uh, I would like to ask to post your questions here on uh, Zoom, as well as uh, uh, on the live on the Facebook. Questions should be as clear as possible, indicating the name of the person to whom the question is addressed. The moderator, me and the Nargiza, uh, will collect these uh, questions and uh, read them out. Uh, so these are the rules of our today's online meeting. The first speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Arne Cornelius. And, uh, dear Mr. Cornelius, and the floor is yours. Uh, the, the, you have uh, up to 10 minutes for your report. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes, we do. Thank you very much. Thank you, first of all, for the very kind invitation. I want to particularly thank uh, Abakon Sultanazarov and his team, uh, the Institute for War and Peace Reporting, and the State Relations Bureau for Analytical Reporting. I've been very much looking forward to this timely and important topic which we're going to discuss today. First of all, uh, in looking at my questions in my uh, theme, well, how geopolitical changes can influence BRI in Central Asia? Uh, what is the future for infrastructure projects and how will BRI and other geopolitical projects in Central Asia interact? Well, first of all, I want to say something which is, I think, the theme for my presentation, that, and that is that COVID-19 does not change the underlying strategic rationale for the One Belt, One Road strategy. In fact, COVID-19 will only cement and strengthen China's strategic rationale and willingness to push forward with a One Belt, One strategy in the long term. While we currently see turmoil because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we see macroeconomic challenges globally. Global energy markets are in turmoil. We are seeing major economic challenges in China. There have been challenges. Many companies collapsed. While China is now seeing a rebound economically and is going back, back to almost to normal, normal conditions, we are seeing Europe going through a lockdown period, the United States, North America, and may, almost the rest of the world basically being in lockdown. That will probably last for the next months or so, and different countries will open up at different points in time. What is important to mention is that the One Belt One Road projects that we see, and there are different projects. Now, the One Belt strategy, which is going from Western China, across Central Asia, Russia, South Asia, the Middle East, and to Europe, the projects that have stopped, that is because of countries are either in lockdown, or uh, basically there are not enough workers to continue with the projects, or because of financial challenges. That will continue for some time in the projects where we see companies collapse well then probably new companies will take over and when they have enough workers particularly also chinese workers that are technically skilled or in leadership positions in their various projects they will come back and continue the projects at different stages but overall the one belt one road strategy will continue russia currently is seeing an increase in covid 19 cases Therefore, Russia is currently going through a challenging period. However, what a lot of European and American journalists and analysts, I think, undermine is Russia's economic resilience. Russia has a stronger economy than I think a lot of analysts and journalists actually see. Therefore, Russia will also, after the COVID-19 pandemic, be able to come back and rebound. Because of Russia's historical links across Central Asia, naturally, and Russian language being the lingua franca in Central Asia, Russia's influence will continue despite China's infrastructure projects with the One Belt, One Road across Central Asia. Europe is cur currently going through a very challenging period with the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, European-Chinese relations post-COVID-19 will also, I think, go through various different stages. Fundamentally speaking, European-Chinese relations will continue, will stabilize over time, although there may be some diplomatic issues and there might be different questions and discussions arising, 
about how the COVID-19 emerged, et cetera, et cetera. Fundamentally speaking, Chinese-European relations will continue and the importance of the One Belt, One Road strategy also for Europe will rebound. And therefore, because of Central Asia's unique geographic epicenter pos position in the Eurasian continent, Central Asia is so important being between China, Russia, the Indian subcontinent, the Middle East and Europe. Therefore, Central Asia is in many ways the important epicenter in the One Belt strategy because it borders the Western Chinese border. So that is actually an important point. Um, India currently is in lockdown. Uh, India's in a situation where it is challenging for India to build infrastructure across the borders because of challenging bilateral relations with Pakistan, with China, even with Bangladesh. So therefore, I think that uh, despite a desire for Russia to build infrastructure projects from the Arctic LNG projects to India to provide gas uh, to India in the future, there will be some time before we can see actually transport corridors being built from Russia to India. But even in that scenario, Central Asia will be important. So Central Asia geopolitical will, geopolitically will be at a very important position. And I think that economically in the future, in the long term, over the next two, three, four decades, Central Asia will see economic growth, will see increased trade activity, will see increased transportation of goods and services through the One Belt Road strategies. And therefore, Central Asia, Central Asia will have an important period and actually be an important, in an important position uh, in the future coming years. So that is fundamentally uh, what I think is important to look at. In terms of infrastructure projects, uh, well, of course, the Meridian Highway, which is going to be built from Western Kazakhstan to Eastern Belarus, uh, will probably be delayed because of the challenges now currently faced by Russia with the COVID-19. But the ability of Russia to use its geostrategic thinking in terms of how Russia utilizes its geography, both internally and thereby also links up with Kazakhstan and links up with Belarus and thereby Europe, shows that Russia's unique location geographically, which stretches from Europe across Asia, is actually very interesting. And therefore, we will also see, I think, in the coming next 10 to 20 years, Russia being an important player in linking geographically and strategically China with Europe. So those are some initial key thoughts I think I wanted to reflect on. But again, fundamentally speaking, COVID-19 will cement and strengthen China's One Belt Road strategy for the future. Thank you very much. Uh, dear Arne, let me thank you for such a high quality and insightful overview of the geopolitical situation and changes in the world. Uh, the format of today's meeting called also for comments after each speaker. So let me give the floor to Raman Vakulchuk, Senior Research Fellow at NUPI, and he will share his vision on the session's topic. Raman, you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Nargis. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Yermek, the whole team that you organized this important event. Um, and uh, I'm also very much uh, grateful for the opportunity to speak to this very important topic. Um, well, a few comments from me. Uh, I think it was a good introduction by uh, Arne, and uh, I share uh, his vision in terms of the uh, well strategic importance of the Belt and Road projects in um, Central Asia. Although I would say that in the short term perspective, actually there are quite a number of risks that may, to some extent, shape the future projections of the uh, existing projects as well as potentially new projects. And uh, but first, I would like to say that what we also see. Uh, in um, geopolitical terms, what was happening before the pandemic. Actually, over the last years, uh, one can trace that, and this is what also we're doing in our study um, at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, we have seen that actually the Belt and Road Initiative of China has triggered interest from other big countries to the region. And actually, uh, many different uh, economic indicators show in terms of trade, in terms of the uh, economic cooperation, we see that actually uh, such countries as the United States, uh, Russia, also the EU, have become more increasingly interested in the region. And one can see this development actually uh, after 2013. At the same time, uh, China has been steadily also developing its infrastructure projects, but uh, they have not really been uh, in terms of uh, kind of after 2013, we should say that they've been very much on the rise before 2013. So I wouldn't say that there has been a very drastic or rapid increase in Chinese project in the region, but 
uh, I would say the positive development for Central Asia is that, as I said, it triggered some more interest from other uh, big uh, and important uh, countries that has resulted in some more economic cooperation in the region. And of course, now with the COVID, I think that uh, although there has been a very uh, positive trends in terms of the Central Asia uh, connecting to the world through globalization, I think now uh, for some time, and of course here we have to distinguish between uh, the period when uh, Central Asia can be back on track, it can be back to the normal situation. Uh, but I think that uh, given the fact that many of the global geopolitical alliances at the moment, they are in a very shaky position, and we we hear many commentators and experts talking about how the future geopolitical alliances will look like. So there might be some changes, and I'm not sure that that on this global background, Central Asia will be central. So I think it will uh, take some time before, for example, China will tackle some of the mounting diplomatic pressure for how it has handled, for example, the pandemic uh, in, uh, domestically. And we see that while well, there's an in increasing uh, opposition uh, from some of the big countries such as India, such as uh, the European Union. So I think probably China will channel most of its diplomatic resources and efforts to try to solve this uh, with, uh, with big partners. Um, and then I think Central Asia for some, for some period will need to act on its own, also in terms of uh, combating the crisis, but then also in terms of maybe not expecting much in terms of the uh, support from other big uh, countries for some moment. So I think it's very important also for Central Asian government to realize that it's a, it's a time to unite efforts uh, and uh, to try to foster more um, regionalization, to try to solve the, the crisis uh, together. Uh, and uh, looking forward, I would say that there are probably two possible scenarios in terms of uh, Chinese presence in Central Asia. I think that depending on the outcome of these big diplomatic clashes and mounting tensions between big countries uh, with respect to the pandemic situation, I think that, well, uh, there's a possibility that China can actually become uh, even a um, sort of, let's say, bigger friend of Central Asia, and um, especially if it's fast to react and to assist the countries in overcoming the situation um, with the pandemic. Uh, and another scenario is that if China then uh, very much on the other fronts, trying to deal uh, with this uh, uh, difficult situation with its uh, partners, then I think it will take uh, quite a while before then we see we can see some more uh, close cooperation between uh, Central Asia uh, and China. But having said that, I also believe, and uh, again, as uh, I said in the beginning, I share uh, Arnest's vision that uh, there will be no fundamental changes for the prospects of the Belt and Road Initiative. The only question is when when this will happen, that uh, this rebound effect will take place. Uh, dear Raman, thank you so much for your valuable thoughts and uh, even forecasts. And today we have also our second commentator. So let me give the floor to our chief expert of the Chinese and Asian Studies Program from the Institute of World Economics and Politics, Anton Bugayenka. Dear Anton, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. You can uh, tell me uh, just a sonologist because it's a very long name. Uh, so, uh, actually my report has a lot of uh, connections with this topic, so, and uh, my session is number three, so I will tell the, uh, my arguments later, but here I want to have, uh, uh, I want to tell a reaction about uh, Mr. Cornelius' uh, report. And uh, the first, I'm uh, totally agree with uh, that uh, um, coronavirus uh, and the lockdown and the crisis do not form a new big trends and it will uh, not a big pivot of uh, Chinese policy in the region and in general too. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's also is watershed uh, and um, this uh, Epidemic uh, will catalyze, will uh, activate the trends that have been uh, outlined earlier in past two, three years. It's uh, how it's said this Mr. Wakulchuk. So, um, this trend is a revision and rejection of uh, previous uh, agreements. It means uh, some uh, projects what uh, not uh, don't have uh, any um, interest for Chinese economy first. Um, 
Second, it's orientation on only projects interesting for economy, uh, Ch Chinese own economy, uh, economy development, especially the Western China, of course, Xinjiang. Um, and it's um, also in uh, number three, it's very high level of idealization of these projects. It's what, uh, what we can see from the uh, from the, uh, the Chinese diplomacy activities in the past uh, three months. It's kind of information war. And uh, this American diplomats, this Chinese diplomats strikes uh, over the world. And here in Central Asia, now we also the part of this is like a world uh, information war. Um, so, uh, and the, uh, um, so what um after uh, and for BRI as a sphere of China's influence, um, it's first first one I want to say this um, BRI will stop for not very long period. It's just uh, less than one two years, um, and it's, uh, just because of technic uh, technical problems, it's uh, lockdown and uh, others, and also about uh, finance resources. But after recovery, BRI starts to be a base of Chinese influence. The world starts to re regionalize, but also uh, split to two spheres. Uh, Central Asian countries will be in in a Chinese spheres of influence, but it will not uh, an iron uh, cotton. Uh, Central Asia, uh, Central Asian states will able to connect with the rest of the world. So the main reason to participate BRI will be uh, 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 for, for China. Um, the main reason to uh, for other states participate BRI, it will be uh, pro Chinese orientation, stronger than before. Uh, before it also like a pro Chinese, but it's uh, like declared officially. But now the China start to look more uh, to uh, some ideological uh, problems, like uh, to say more pro Chinese things. So uh, for Central Asia, uh, uh, Central Asian countries will be more and more oriented on export to China, and it's um, oil, it's ore and metal, uh, China. This market is the biggest perspective market for, uh, uh, of course, uh, as um, uh, Mr. Cornelison said, that's um, uh, that's um, it's, uh, European Union economics now it's falling down, and uh, only Chinese economy and uh, near to Central Asia is still uh, growing. So. Uh, and Chinese businesses uh, in manufacturing will grow and become to be uh, systematically significant. And China will hold all positions left by Western companies in the mineral and mining industry of they will left, uh, if, if uh, Western companies will left Central Asia. Uh, so that's my all uh, things. What can I say on this uh, topic now? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, dear Anton. Uh, thank you, dear uh, Mr. Arne, for your insightful speech. Uh, thank you, uh, Raman. Uh, our commentators, I think, could add very interesting insights. And uh, if to follow our agenda, we can discuss our uh, next uh, second uh, session. Uh, dear Ermek. Thank you, Nargiza. Uh, in the second session, we continue to uh, discuss more deeply the implementation of the Chinese Belt and uh, Road Initiative in Central Asia with the emphasis on economy. So China, China's economic uh, ties are integral uh, to regional cooperation. Given the Beijing's significant role as an investor in Central Asia, we are interested in discussing the economic uh, consequences of the coronavirus. The, the main question is how the slowdown in the Chinese economy can affect the projects of uh, Belt and Road Initiative. So let me give you the, uh, so let me give the floor to the Dr. Catherine Owen, the British Academy postdoctoral fellow. Uh, Dr. Owen, please go ahead. You have uh, time up to 10 minutes. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, yes. Fantastic. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for having me on this um, online discussion. It's really, really interesting. It's also 
my first uh, online conference and um, yeah, it seems to be going really well so far. So perhaps this could be a blueprint uh, for the future. Um, so um, yeah, I am gonna give basically a brief overview of the emerging economic impacts of COVID-19 on China and Central Asia. Uh, and then I'm gonna outline two scenarios. Um, of course, we all know that uh, Central Asian countries are strongly reliant on the Chinese economy, uh, with China before the crisis being the destination for about a fifth of all Central Asian exports and a third of their imports. So, of course, what happens in the Chinese economy will have a huge impact on Central Asian economies. Um, so, um, just according to the latest sort of data that has come out in the last week, um, we can see that in the first quarter of 2020, the Chinese economy shrank by nearly 7% compared to the same time last year. Imports fell by nearly 3% and exports fell by over 13%. Um, however, to put this in a global context, the World Trade Organization uh, expects global trade to fall by 32% uh, in 2020. Um, of course, um, developing countries, uh, including Central Asia, are gonna be the hardest hit by COVID-19. Um, in, uh, in Central Asia, the uh, largely remittance-based economies uh, of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan are being hit as swathes of migrant workers are laid off from their jobs in Russia. Uh, and the largely resource-based economies of Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, they are hit by plummeting oil and gas prices. All countries, of course, have fragile healthcare systems. Um, and on the 26th of March, Kyrgyzstan became the, fir uh, the world's first country to receive uh, 120 million soft loan from the uh, IMF, the International Monetary Fund, to tackle the economic impact of uh, COVID-19. Um, so I'll just quickly uh, outline uh, sort of Chinese um, approach to overseas investments. So uh, as, as is obviously well known, China has, uh, Chinese, Chinese lenders have lent billions of dollars to Central Asia. Uh, with loans uh, often secured against commodities, meaning that when borrowers default, countries must cede natural resources or infrastructure apparatus. So whether Chinese lenders will restructure these loans or press for repayments remains to be seen, but we, I think we can look to uh, the case of Africa to sort of see uh, what Chinese practices uh, might be. Um, so in the past, Chinese lenders have either written off debt to African countries or they've restructured it. Um, and uh, towards the beginning of April, a Chinese spokesperson did say that China is considering working on a bilateral basis to restructure debt repayments uh, more broadly. Um, it's unlikely that it would join the sort of uh, wider push uh, by the, I think it's the, was it the Jubilee debt campaign to uh, collectively uh, write off African debt. Um, but there are also, I think it's important to, to, to note that there are no examples to date of China seizing assets. So with all this in, in mind, then let's uh, just think about uh, two scenarios, um, how this could play out. Um, the first one is that um, Chinese investors take advantage of the dire global situation and purchase greater amounts of failing assets overseas. And then the other one is that uh, China reigns in its overseas loans and development projects and turns its economic focus inward. So I'll just, there are sort of a bit of evidence uh, for both of these theories. Regarding the first one, so we're seeing greater levels of engagement, uh, not only in Central Asia, but I suppose also uh, in the world. Um, so I think at the end of March, it was about a month ago, um, an economist at the People's Bank of China stated that local governments are likely to respond by investing in high cost infrastructure projects, uh, which will be supported by uh, trillions of yuan of local government bonds being released as fiscal stimulus. So local governments then at China's peripheries um, including in, in, in Xinjiang and also perhaps in Yunnan and other places, um, will uh, might choose to expand already extensive cross-border cooperation with low-income neighbouring countries. Um, also just last week, uh, NATO warned uh, its members that China might take advantage uh, of uh, the economic slowdown in, in the West and buy up um, important strategic assets. Um, there is little concrete evidence to support, to support this claim so far, but obviously reports have been emerging that the Chinese economy is getting back on track much more quickly after the crisis, as has been uh, mentioned by other speakers. So, of course, this is a possibility. Um, and then moving on to the second, uh, um, uh, the second sort of uh, projection that actually China will uh, rein in its overseas activities. 
So while it was already slowing in uh, 2019 due to the US-China trade war, uh, Chinese overseas investments are predicted uh, to slow uh, because of low levels of liquidity and uh, directions from government to channel what cash they do have into the domestic economy first and foremost. Um, and then also as you know, on a purely practical uh, level, as has been mentioned by other speakers, um, the restrictions on population movement, of course, mean that uh, BRI projects actually cannot really currently physically uh, take place. Um, so um, I think there's one thing that I'd like to just mention before concluding is that, of course, I think we have to be really careful about speaking of China or chi the Chinese, China as a sort of unitary actor. There are numerous different Chinese lenders, including banks, China-led multilateral organizations, state-owned enterprises, even wealthy individuals, and each of these uh, have slightly different priorities different regulations, different strategies. And so to talk about, yeah, this sort of, you know, singular, coherent, coordinated overseas strategy is perhaps a bit of an oversimplification. Therefore, we might see in some areas uh, a ramping up of Chinese uh, engagement or perhaps a, a withdrawal in others, depending on uh, the specific uh, in investor or, or economic actor. Um, and then I suppose just very briefly before concluding, uh, I'd like to say, that I think two things we really need to, 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 to talk about in this regard is how Chinese investment actually exacerbates economic um, inequality in uh, Central Asia and uh, corruption as well due to its very uh, lack of oversight um, transparency measures uh, in its um, uh, economic dealings. Um, so I think that should always be a part of the conversation when we're thinking about um, yeah, how the economic impacts of um, Chinese activities in Central Asia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Owen, for your uh, such informative speech uh, with uh, building uh, two different scenarios, how the things can go. Indeed, uh, we often forget that the, the crisis is a time of opportunity and someone can uh, win from, for, from this situation. On the other hand, as you said, the 2019 trade war between the United States and the China uh, could make PRC to pay more attention to the domestic economy. So it's interesting to see that the battle of these two giants uh, may affect the projects in Central Asia. Uh, I think the next two commenters will also have an interesting opinion uh, on this topic. I pass the word to uh, Mr. Uh, Arne Carnelison. Uh, dear Mr. Carnelison, the floor is yours. You have uh, two, three minutes for a short comment on this subject. Thank you very much. I would just like to uh, provide some brief comments, to particularly what uh, Roman and uh, and uh, Anton, but also what Catherine mentioned. And I think that, uh, yes, I mean, we're going to see now a, probably one to two, three years, maybe, or one to two years, where, where a range of projects uh, across Central Asia related to uh, the One Belt strategy will uh, basically be, be stopped. We'll be waiting until the projects can resume because of lockdown. And I completely agree with what Catherine said that, you know, there's not one single Chinese big project. There are a range of different players, but on you know, the financial scene, on the technical scene, I mean, companies involved, I mean, there are a range of different players, but I just had to really kind of provide some, you know, overarching lines because of the limited time I had. Uh, and the thing, what I look at, I think is important also is to consider is that China's one belt, one, one road strategy is not a one year or a five year project. This is a strategy for the next centuries, basically. And I think we'll, if we look at the Eurasian continent, if we look at the massive Eurasian continent, there is very limited infrastructure capacity on the continent today, which connects the east of Asia with Europe. There is fairly limited. Therefore, I think there is a need for more infrastructure capacity and more transport corridors more railroad uh, possibilities and more highway possibilities in order to transport goods, services, people, uh, and products in the future. I think also when we, if we look at what and how will one belt, the One Belt strategy influence economically Central Asia, I saw there were some questions about that. Well, I mean, first of all, currently, what I'm uh, hearing is that the flow of transportation from China across to Kazakhstan is basically the same as it was before COVID-19. Even uh, they were also increased a little bit. That is one point, important point. Secondly, if we look at specific logistics clusters, such as Korgos, such as Aktau and others, we are seeing basically a nexus of logistics, transportation, special economic zones, and trade 
increasing and gravitating people towards it and companies towards it. Yes, there will be inequality, there will be challenges, and yes, there might also be corruption. Cannot dispute that at all, which Catherine raised, and I think that's important. Um, but the general overarching trend, I think, is that we will see an econ increased economic growth because of the introduction of a range of different One Belt, One Road projects across Central Asia, with Russia, uh, South in, in South Asia, etc. So that is kind of the general trend. But at, yes, there will be major risks, there will be challenges, and also there was a question in terms of how potentially the COVID-19 may influence perception of Chinese workers. Well, unfortunately, that may happen in some instances. Um, we are seeing, uh, tragically, an, an increase of racism in the dialogue in social media and in other instances that uh, must be stopped uh, in the way it can be. Um, you know, because I think it's important to build dialogue, but there will be challenges and there will be diplomatic disputes, which was also raised, I think, by Roman. And I think that's that's a very fair point. Um, there might also be, as we see now, possible lawsuits, uh, diplomatic quarrels, uh, in fighting. Um, but overall, in the longer term, when the COVID-19 effects calm down and we see, when we see a reemergence of the global economy over the next three to five, seven years, because it will take a few years before the global economy really comes back on its feet, I think that we will see stabilization over time and the resumption of the projects. Thank you, Mr. Cornelison, for this valuable comment. Uh, I think uh, everybody hoped that the global economy, along with the Chinese economy, will will be will stabilize in in the coming years next years so the next commander is uh, dr uh, raman vakulchuk raman please go ahead yeah thank you uh, well i would like to stress uh, two main points that i think would be uh, quite crucial for uh, chinese engagement with central asia and also for the central asian uh, sort of engagement with uh, with china i think here uh, it would be very i mean both sides really need to to redefine their approaches to, uh, the, to the Belt and Road Initiative in a sense that what we see now and when we see now at the, when we look at the impact, what we see is that actually many local contractors are on the verge of be, being bankrupt. Also, I mean, because of this, many of the projects have been stopped. Uh, actually, there's no uh, insurance, I would say, that would sort of cover for the risks of such situation. Uh, which means that this actually increases the costs. And uh, I mean, the costs of uh, not being uh, able to implement the, those projects, especially the, given the fact that uh, many countries, like small countries like Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, they have uh, borrowed a lot of uh, different loans. And now the question is how to uh, solve uh, the situation concerning the insurance scheme and all these losses that uh, local contractors are, are going to carry. So it's, what's really important is that uh, China, but also Central Asia, they come up with a strategy of sort of reconsidering and taking into account those risks that's already there and that we see down all those uh, losses. So it would be really important to look at the terms of the uh, new projects, as well as maybe reconsider some of the uh, terms of the projects that have been already started in Central Asia. Uh, also, maybe adding a lot of uh, emphasis on the, uh, you know, such things as actually also work, workforce health. We already see, you know, some uh, concerns in the region that uh, about the participation of the local workforce in the Chinese projects, and there's some mounting evidence showing that well, there are also a lot of also how about the uh, and uh, we did a big study last year where we collected the data for one two hundred sixty one Chinese projects, including uh, uh, Belt and Road projects and also bilateral projects. And we see a lot of uh, very weak coordination. And then also the, the, this issue was raised uh, uh, already that, well, in fact, uh, there's actually not well uh, developed coordination on the Chinese side, but also in, in Central Asia. But I can get to this more in my uh, next panel to, to give you some more details on this. Thank you, Dr. Vagulchuk, for your valuable comment. So, uh, concluding up the, on this session, we have uh, discussed how the uh, changing economic situation in China 
uh, influence will somehow or somehow already influence the implementation of the PRI in Central Asia. Let me pass the floor to my colleague Nargiza, who starts the third session. Nargiza. Thank you, dear Ermiak. Uh, yes, really, we discussed uh, very thoroughly the economic consequences of the coronavirus, but what about other aspects? What will the coronavirus impact beyond the global economy and uh, supply chains? We want to hear our speakers assess the other possible consequences of the pandemic vis-a-vis -vis promotion of the BRI in Central Asia. So I yield the floor to our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Raman Vakulchuk. Raman? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, I have three main points um, that I would like to stress, and some of them have been already uh, mentioned by my colleagues and also myself. But I would like to start first uh, with the, uh, I think, probably crucial uh, point, and that, that relates to the short-term uh, prospects um, and the sort of the rebuilding of uh, economic cooperation uh, between China and Central Asia, as well as other countries. But I think first is that it's really important that the future development of BRI will depend on how fast China can tackle domestic economic difficulties uh, and also dismounting international diplomatic pressure. I think that will, will be very important. And so the longer it takes, the consequences for Central Asia will be harder and more uh, difficult. So I think the, the, the kind of actually the timing of uh, Chinese solving its uh, issues domestically and also internationally will be very important. I also uh, came across an uh, analysis by Kevin Root, who's a former prime minister of Australia, who tried to uh, list different type of uh, uh, sort of uh, priorities on the Chinese domestic agenda. And there he says that, well, actually out of 10 different priorities, uh, Central Asian Belt and Road Initiative, they come as number eight. And then uh, basically all the domestic issues that China needs to solve come as the more important. And I think, well, there's certain truth to that, uh, given, again, all these constraints and also economic difficulties that China is uh, fa facing with. Uh, I think also the fact that um, uh, f uh, depending how China will get back to the uh, Belt and Road uh, agenda, how fast it gets back to this agenda and promoting it, this will also have implications on to what extent projects will be delayed. And I think it's very important probably also to think that probably it will take uh, maybe a couple of years before China uh, could launch new projects. I think there'll be probably quite maybe fast reaction to the projects that have been already started, have been already launched, but it may take a while before there'll be new projects that could continue continually expanding the uh, well, infrastructure projects, also energy projects in the region. Also then the question is then what to do with the fact that uh, it's not only uh, well Central Asian companies that uh, carry different uh, short-term risks uh, and also financial burden, but also uh, some of the Chinese uh, state-owned companies. We also know that now they are, there's like this motivation uh, coming from the central Chinese government to withdraw from the risky uh, project overseas. So it will also take a while, uh, and I think there will be some reconsideration of to what extent uh, Chinese will continue to uh, go like business as usual before the pandemic actually started. Um, and the second point, I think that really the image of China and the Belt and Road Initiative will depend on how China reacts to the post-pandemic situation in Central Asia. So far, we have seen quite limited engagement. Uh, here I talk about, for example, the uh, assistance in terms of the medical supply um, to the countries. Uh, for example, Kyrgyzstan hasn't uh, received much of support, although there were some requests already. Uh, some countries got some limited support. So I think it will be very important um, aspect um, that could also have some implications to what extent uh, there'll be some rising anti-Chinese sentiment in Central Asia, or actually to, to, to the contrary, to maybe there'll be actually some, you know, um, uh, further uh, build up of some mutual relations uh, and trust quite fast. Uh, but what I really think, again, I would like to stress is that uh, this aspect that has been uh, not very much on the agenda in the existing uh, Belt and Road projects is this issue of sustainability of those projects. Uh, again, issues related to transparency, bankability, also workforce health uh, among the people who take part in the infrastructure project. And I mentioned the study we did last year together with the OEC Academy where we look at uh, uh, 261 Chinese projects. I think one particular area where uh, 
there's a, there's a big room for improvement uh, has to do with the energy sector. And this was, didn't get much attention in, in, uh, in the international uh, sort of analysis and expertise. So there has been quite limited attention to the uh, energy projects. And uh, we counted that over the last 10 years, China invested more than 90 billion uh, US dollars in different types of energy projects in Central Asia. However, uh, less than 1% of this funding went to the green energy and renewable energy. And it's, I think it's quite a, a, par a bigger paradox that you have China as the biggest uh, producer of solar panels and also one of the fast fastest expanding markets uh, with renewable energy. But then you have very little investment uh, of ch from China to Central Asia, for example, in the area of clean energy. And if you talk about sustainability and especially the long-term prospects of such projects, I think it's really important that uh, there's more, uh, I would say, engagement and also uh, there should be also more interest from the Central Asian governments to provide conditions for increasing cooperation in this area. Because, I mean, there are many risks on continuing to invest in the traditional energy and we all know about the uh, stranded assets. So the more there'll be investment in the oil and gas projects in Central Asia, it means that the, the region will be more uh, exposed to some you know, uh, to more risks concerning the greenhouse gas emissions and possible uh, global carbon tax. So I think this has to be taken into account in any future projects. And the third, the last point, and I, which I think is very important for me, uh, is that there's very little coordination on the part of Central Asia when it comes to the Belt and Road related projects. So what I really think is necessary for Central Asian governments, not only to, to try to deal and solve the uh, crisis, but also in terms of its future, uh, more, I would say, um, effective and successful uh, collaboration with, with China, it's that I think the Central Asian governments, they need to create uh, a regional Belt and Road coordination platform. What we learn again, coming back to this uh, study of 261 projects, we see that they are all implemented on very much still bilateral level. There's very limited coordination and communication between Central Asian governments. While I think that establishing such a platform where all five Central Asian uh, countries and governments could meet would provide a lot of benefits because this would uh, help, for example, to think how to maximize the effects of the common infrastructure projects, right? So how to also identify common risks and opportunities. Because now countries, they very much act on their own and it's very much bilateral. Uh, although, of course, most of the projects that China uh, develops in the region, they are very much uh, regional. Uh, and they cover a lot of regions. So what I really think is important that uh, Central Asia tries to establish such a regular platform where they would first meet to discuss all the projects to see how they actually fit and also to what extent they match with the national uh, strategic uh, development plans of those countries. I think there's there are a lot of uh, opportunities there that can be utilized. Uh, and I think there are already some examples. You have the EU-China connectivity platform that was established for the same purpose. So I think that uh, the, the sooner this happens and Central Asians set up such a platform, the better off they would be in terms of maximizing the economic effects uh, from that um, uh, uh, kind of projects. But also I think this could also help in many other smaller aspects. For example, there's a, I think there's a need for joint approach to labor policy. I think uh, the potential to utilize domestic labor has been underexploited and quite underutilized. And now we have the situation with the labor migration, for example, and labor migrants who, um, uh, with remittances stopping in Russia because of the situation, right? But then, of course, I think there's a huge potential for involving more of the local workforce in uh, many of the Chinese projects, which has not been really the case. So in many ways, this could help to solve the situation on the ground. With that, I would like to talk. We can take questions, I think, later. Thank you so much, uh, dear Raman, even for your uh, recommendations uh, about a regional Central Asian platform on BRI. Uh, and I'd like to say that in this uh, session, we have two keynote speakers, and the second is uh, sinologist Anton Bugayenka. So, uh, Anton, you are welcome with your speech. Hey, can you hear me? Uh, okay, so... Yes, um, we can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, my speech is mostly 
from uh, views is from Kazakhstan side, but also very, I think, very important for uh, other Central Asian states. So for answering the question of uh, BRI future in Central Asia, we should follow three main topics. First, uh, what influence coronavirus, uh, coronavirus crisis will have uh, on all Chinese economy and the parts related to BRI? Second, what influence crisis uh, will have um, uh, uh, what influence uh, coronavirus crisis will have on Central Asia uh, economies, especially what parts of economies or industries will need to recovery, or what influence uh, will crisis have to start its uh, to have to state stability. And the third uh, main question is uh, how Chinese policy in coronavirus crisis already change, changed uh, in these three, four months. So the first question is influence of coronavirus in China's economy uh, related to BRI. Uh, the first things here is uh, cutting finance resources able to invest uh, in development economies. Chinese companies will concentrate on recovery on the economy. Uh, China also will have a Western withdrawal of production from China. It means Western companies um, perhaps uh, will cut uh, China, not all, but most of them. Um, it's a new trend on uh, re regionalization. And the uh, second thing here is unemployment problem. Um, if you know that in China now it's a, it's a big uh, problem. Um, last year it's around 6% of uh, unemployment uh, Mm, unemployment in China is uh, around six percent. So, uh, and um, now this problem much uh, will be bigger, and um, it means that Chinese companies can't export jobs to other states. Uh, what's very important? Uh, what was very important for Central Asian states? Because if you see the all new projects, we usually look to how is um, how ma how many uh, jobs creating in central uh, in our economies so um, second things uh, Chinese economy will be more isolated from the world economy system here will be two ways from isolation and orientation on the domestic market Chinese economy will not need new investments abroad but it's uh, discussable uh, things. So the second way is uh, is if Chinese economy after isolate and concentrate on on its market domestic economy become bigger and bigger and Chinese comp uh, companies will need expansion outside of China. This point more related to manufacturing sector and less related to mining and technologies because uh, they have uh, own uh, trends. So and technologies, uh, China will have a technological uh, breakthrough. Uh, means technological revolution. You see, it's world technological revolution starting in China. Uh, 5G as example. Uh, for and uh, here it's a. Uh, one, China's economy will export uh, some technological solutions to elite states. Uh, this will uh, be a new interesting element of uh, political part of BRI. And the second, um, from technology uh, development and if China, uh, uh, from te technology development, uh, China, uh, uh, after China start to reopen economy, um, Chinese companies will be able to export simple production chains. So here we'll be see a new uh, period of um, Chinese companies able to create new jobs in uh, Central Asian states. Um, so uh, second main question is influence of coronavirus in uh, Central Asia related to be right. Uh, here's the first uh, main thing, it's falling down of small and medium business. Include my uh, machine industry, manufacturing, uh, manufacturers, Mm. Perhaps this place in economy will be taken by uh, Russian big companies. They are bigger and active in one Eurasian economic union area and uh, they will have a government supporting. So I heard here some of uh, speakers already said that the Russian economy is very strong and uh, we are in one union and after our small and medium business uh, falling down, uh, some Russian companies can uh, can um, uh, take some of uh, of piece of this cake uh, in Central Asian economies. 
So uh, Chinese, uh, here is Chinese business positions in these parts of economy. It's manufacturing, service, or uh, some other uh, part, parts like this. Uh, not so strong as Russian, but uh, Chinese business also will take a part of this cake and became the systematically significant. Now it's not, um, if we see this, for example, in Kazakhstan, this 51, uh, now it's 56 projects. Um, actually, uh, they have um, a lot of positive things for our, our, our Kazakhstan economy, but um, no, they're not systematically significant. And in the future, we'll see this Chinese, Chinese companies uh, in uh, not only in oil industry, but in the other uh, parts of economies will be grow up. Uh, so the second uh, main things here, it's uh, income reduction in mineral resources export. There will be two main results of deals with China. Um, first is supply expansion uh, to the Chinese market. After the period of recovery, Chinese economy will need more resources. Uh, European Union, it's Kazakhstan main uh, market uh, of oil for oil uh, export, need more time to recovery. And Chinese market will be a good alternative, especially in the front of uh, competition of, of oil exporters in Euro, uh, Europe Union, as well, Russia and uh, Saudi Arabia. So China is uh, China is a low price but it's stability at the growing market. So uh, maybe we will uh, see some, or some new infrastructure and refinery projects here. Um, second, oil, uh, second uh, things from uh, income reduction. Uh, oil price failing let us uh, to pay attention on other uh, export things, uh, especially it's mining, iron, steel, or um, and China here is already its number one destination of our exporters, uh, especially for Kazakhstan, but uh, other Central Asian countries too. Um, so the third main thing is failing living standards. After states, a government can support uh, social system on the level they had before. Uh, this will have some effects for stability and let public failing uh, to the social upheaval. Um, in this situation, some actors will use uh, xenophobia in interior policy, and they will have an occasion. China will try to take back its own uh, loans, as, uh, I mean money, from, gov uh, from Central Asian states governments. Uh, and uh, Anton, I, I apologize for interrupting you. Uh, you have one minute. Okay, uh, I almost finished. Uh, the, first, the third question is how China's policy in coronavirus already changed in these three, four months. Uh, this topic we will con concentrate on the next session, so I just tell just a few moments here. Uh, now we see a big aggressive Chinese reaction, but this first this reaction is uh, reaction goal is uh, resist United States. Uh, the second is not aggressive to official governments, but it's badly affecting to the public opinion. So, and here I will very briefly just to say uh, the future of BRI. Uh, my vision on the future of BRI include two parts. Midterm uh, is the path of implementation, and the long term it's a resuming, impl uh, resuming implementation of BRI. Uh, in midterm, it's around one to three years. Uh, uh, China will stop uh, many projects uh, because of technical reasons. It's lockdown and uh, others, and also about the, because of less finance resources. Um, and um, China will quit from some projects. It's not effective for China's economy uh, in isolation trend and uh, projects with political uh, motivation, which also not effective for China's economy. And in the long term, China's uh, goals are crisis will be to take resources from own economy, making our own production chains. And the three is uh, do not uh, let Central Asia become anti-Chinese region. Uh, perhaps for this, China will cooperate with Russia. Um, and the rest of things I will say in the next session. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Lee Anton. We have also two commentators in this session, and maybe our commentators have a alternative point of view or some additions. So let me give the floor to Dr. Catherine Owen. Thank you. Uh, they were both really interesting, um, really interesting talks. I would say um, 
I absolutely agree that um, China's response uh, in Central Asia uh, will have a big impact on public feeling um, and that hitherto it has been very limited, um, particularly in this region, which, as we know, um, does harbour quite significant Sinophobic uh, sentiments. Um, so, I, yeah, I do feel that um, China could really up its, uh, I suppose, health diplomacy uh, in, in the region. Um, but actually, um, I, I interpreted the questions we were sent uh, somewhat differently to, uh, to the speakers. Um, just for the audience, we were asked um, whether it's relevant to compare political regimes um, or whether there are any universal tools that, that, that might help. Um, and so I sort of was thinking about this question um, and um, I sort of thinking about it perhaps a little bit more abstractly. And um, I, I guess my thought here is that actually, yeah, it, when we're thinking about political regimes, the democracy authoritarian uh, binary uh, is really not uh, the key factor here, um, but actually um, state capacity is. Um, and by state capacity, I mean the um, ability to mobilize and distribute resources and, and, and services. Um, so, you know, there's been a, there's quite a lot of interesting sociological work done on this notion of um, state capacity. I'm particularly thinking of work like uh, Charles Tilley, um, who says that, you know, protection of citizens or, or subjects or citizens is one of the four key activities of, of the state. So if we just take, uh, for example, Russia and China, uh, both countries may be broadly described as authoritarian. Yet uh, Russia is doing relatively badly in managing the crisis, yet China has done relatively well. Similarly, uh, speaking about democracies, we could say both the UK and uh, Germany are democracies, yet the UK is doing quite badly, uh, while, the UK, uh, while Germany is, is, is doing much better. Um, so what do Russia and uh, UK and China and Germany have, have in common? I would say that the former have a lower levels of state capacity following years of uh, austerity and, and state restructuring, whereas uh, China and Germany have a much higher levels uh, of uh, a much better funded public sector and are much better able to uh, distribute uh, and mobilize uh, resources. Um, what this means for the context of Central Asia, of course, is that actually in all five countries, um, the uh, state capacity is, is, is relatively weak, uh, although obviously stronger in, in, in some than, than, than others. Um, but I do think that, yeah, considering this question of, of, of democracy versus as authoritarian, authoritarianism is one uh, that's, that's very, very interesting to, to look at in this regard. Thanks. Thank you, dear Dr. Catherine. Uh, and now let's uh, listen to uh, sinologist uh, Timur Umara. So, Timur, you are welcome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I also um, want to thank everyone for organizing this great um, event today. Um, I uh, also got the um, uh, when we got this um, plan. I was thinking about this um, comparison of political regimes um, and how they respond to um, coronavirus. I definitely agree with Catherine. Um, on um, uh, the, the feature that um, fighting those kinds of pandemics, um, it, it is very important to have um, this ability to move resources from one place to another uh, so um, they can cope with um, many um, ill uh, people at the same time. And stuff like that. But um, in uh, when we talk about Central Asia, um, I guess um, it is true to say that um, if uh, you have a, um, I'm not. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that uh, authoritarian uh, regime is better or uh, anything like that. But um, in in case of emergency. Um, I think it's true to say that um, in authoritarian states, um, the power that uh, the state has over uh, controlling the movement of the population is uh, much stronger than in uh, dem democratic um, states. Um, at least um, those who rule those kind of uh, countries don't have, uh, you know, problems with. Uh, people getting annoyed um, or uh, people uh, talking about human rights um, because they um, actually 
um, were not lucky enough to have um, all of the human rights before the crisis. So um, I guess for um, authoritarian states, it is a bit easier um, to, um, for example, lock the cities as uh, China did, um, lock the regions or um, close the borders um, than it is um, in other states. Um, and uh, talking about universal tools or approaches, I guess there are, um, when we talk about uh, fighting pandemic um, or localizing the virus, um, there are universal tools. Um, uh, first of all, you just um, have to uh, uh, practice social distancing. Um, like uh, there, are, there are two ways, okay. Um, first way is the um, Chinese way and the, the way that um, many other countries followed um, Central Asia as well. Um, and the other one is the um, uh, Taiwan and South Korea cases. Um, as you know, in those countries, um, they um, started as early as possible tracking those people who supposedly have um, coronavirus and um, using uh, surveillance cameras and uh, technology to make sure that all of the people that uh, those people have contact with are uh, tested. Um, so um, more, you have one minute. Okay, um, so this is definitely not the case for Central Asian states. That's why they decided, um, and it's a very wise decision to um, just close the borders, um, close the people in their homes, um, so the virus would not have um, any chance to uh, transfer from people to people. Thank you, dear Timur. Uh, thank you to our keynote speakers, uh, to our commentators. I think this session was too long, maybe because of this very interesting topic. And I also would like to add that uh, I agree with uh, Raman that uh, Central Asia, uh, China, multilateral relations depend not only on China, but also on Central Asian countries that must be uh, more active and uh, uh, coordinate BRI projects. So let me close this uh, session and give the floor to my colleague, Ermek Baisala. Thank you, Nargiza. So uh, let's move on to the next session. This is the last fourth session where we will uh, discuss the Chinese soft power in the new circumstances. Uh, there are numerous ongoing discussions about the China and its uh, image in the mass media and among experts. The assessments are at times contradictory, with some discussing how China will improve its image using new mechanisms such as uh, uh, medical soft power, while others stressing its worsening image uh, on the world stage. So we have decided to devote our last final session to our experts' uh, view on these uh, inconsistent evaluations. Uh, let me give uh, the floor to the Mr. Uh, Umarov, Timur Umarov, who, uh, who will uh, tell about uh, about us about the uh, Chinese soft power, the changing Chinese soft power nowadays? Timur, please go ahead. Yeah, um, here I am again. Thank you so much. Um, those questions that were put um, uh, that were sent to me before um, was that some ex experts say uh, that. The, uh, about the talk about uh, worsening of uh, China's image, while others claim uh, that uh, the reputation improved after the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, uh, I would say I, I agree with both. Uh, maybe for some people the image of China improved, but for others um, it definitely um, worsened. Um, and um, first of all, I want to start by saying that um, I totally agree, agree with the, the idea that we started this event with, um, that Arnett told that we're not going to appear in a new reality after a pandemic will be over. Um, what we are going to see is um, just the 
trends that have been there for several years already. Those trends are going to uh, continue to be more visible to us. Um, if we talk about soft power, Chinese soft power is a very uh, popular topic among um, China watchers. Everyone loves this topic. Um, and when you uh, mention soft power, the uh, three things that came to my mind um, appear to actually be um, the, the pillars of uh, Chinese soft power around the world and in Central Asia as well. Um, first of all, it's like the main symbol of um, uh, Chinese soft power, uh, Confucius Institutes. Mm, and uh, China studies classes uh, in um, all around the world. In Central Asia, we have 13 of them, and uh, the number is uh, growing. The last one was opened in Samarkand, in my hometown. Um, and we have like more than um, 20,000 students. Uh, that are learning Chinese um, in the region. So I don't think that this trend um, is gonna mm, disappear. I don't think that after pandemic people will uh, stop learning Chinese. Um, it's still a very, um, very valuable asset for a person uh, to know Chinese uh, because China is still a uh, second largest economy. Uh, China's uh, economy is already um, recovering, um, started to recover. Um, the pandemic is in China uh, seems to be uh, seems to be over. Mm. Uh, so um, I don't think that people are gonna forget about Chinese. Um, the second pillar of uh, China's soft power is um, exchange programs. Um, this is somehow connected with the first pillar. Um, for uh, people in Central Asia, uh, China is a very popular destination to uh, get their degrees. Um, um, I myself got my master's um, in China and a lot of my friends uh, did the same. So um, according to statistics, there are more than 30,000 students were in 2018. Um, I also don't think this is going to change in the New Year's future uh, because this gives um, a lot of opportunities for people um, at home. Um, and the third pillar is international media. Um, and here uh, we see that China totally fails um, in uh, popularization of, uh, of its international media in Central Asia. First of all, uh, because it's uh, like I'm talking about those um, outlets and uh, TV channels like CCTV and China Daily that are not in Chinese, but um, in English or uh, Russian. Um, first of all, they don't have uh, national language, language um, media. Um, they only have um, Russian CCTV. Uh, which is not uh, very popular, I guess. Um, and another thing is uh, uh, has uh, a lot to do with um, internal um, situation in Central Asia. We know that many, um, most of the countries that are don't have uh, freedom of uh, total freedom of press, and um, it would be really difficult for uh, Chinese international media to come to Central Asia. Um, so those are the um, things that uh, China succeeded in, uh, but there are still a uh, lot of problems with Chinese soft power in the region, um, and those problems are not going to disappear. Um, so first of all, it's anti-Chinese sentiment. Um, Anti-Chinese movements are uh, driven, in my view, by um, some nationalistic uh, groups, um, at least in um, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. Um, in uh, COVID-19, the thing is that uh, we know that it's not the first time China became, uh, like China, the, the epidemic originated in China. Um, and this gives uh, fuel to those nationalistic groups to um, continue uh, 
like hating China or uh, being dissatisfied with the uh, uh, Chinese expansion in the region. Um, and China sees those problems. China uh, tries to address them by, um, first of all, um, public diplomacy. In the recent times, we've seen that Chinese officials became very active um, in Western social media that is blocked in China, but uh, they are uh, very successful in using it. For example, if you go to um, right now, if you open um, the Twitter of the embassy of China in Kazakhstan, the first thing that you will see that um, uh, they are supporting WHO and um, talking trash about uh, President Trump. Um, I, I don't know whether the Chinese embassy in Kazakhstan should be thinking about uh, China-U.S. relations and whether um, this is the main uh, purpose of their um, embassy in Kazakhstan. But uh, they do think that it's very important for Kazakh people to know um, uh, how our relations with uh, the U.S. are going. Um, another uh, example of um, uh, China's presence in social media um, is a, a Telegram channel. For example, uh, Uzbek uh, embassy, um, uh, sorry, Chinese embassy in Uzbekistan has a Telegram channel, and they post a lot of um, interesting stuff there, um, from how to make an origami to um, s news of um, Chinese um, officials helping um, Uzbek people fight coronavirus. And here we come to uh, this um, new trend uh, that we've witnessed for um, several months, um, is uh, so-called mask diplomacy. Um, China has shown um, uh, that um, it's willing to um, help uh, Central Asian states to fight coronavirus. China shows that um, uh, right now um, in the world, China is a responsible power. It's not um, what, what, in my view, what Beijing wants to uh, change is that is, is this um, perception of China as a source of COVID-19 and China wants to change it to, um, to the, the very responsible power, responsible superpower that helps other countries uh, with masks, with um, knowledge, with um, uh, sending um, its own medical personnel to um, help fighting um, this uh, crisis. Um, but all in all, um, uh, in the end, uh, social uh, soft power, sorry, came comes to the popularization of the way of life, and in this term, uh, China fails completely. Um, people uh, in Central Asia. Excuse me, you have one minute. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm already um, in the ending. Um, people in Central Asia um, do not know uh, many things about uh, China's culture. For example, if you if you ask anyone who is um, noticing one of the most famous Chinese science fiction writer. Um, I don't think there will be many people who've uh, heard about him or um, how many Chinese celebrities can you, can um, like ordinary person on the street name except for Jackie Chan um, or does anyone in Central Asia listen to Chinese music or watch uh, Chinese um, TV series? Um, no one does, and uh, here we come uh, to the notion that um, Russia and the United States are still, in terms of uh, soft power, are uh, two main um, players in Central Asia, and China has a long way to um, go uh, to that level. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.
Thank you. Thank you, dear Timur, for uh, such informative speech. I totally agree with you. And uh, I think people know not only uh, Jackie Chan, but also Jet Li and other actors. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So indeed, in the beginning of the pandemic, the China seemed to be a global outcast. Uh, xenophobia and racism grew throughout the world. And not only Chinese, but also other Asian people felt, felt that. So further, as we saw, the China become the first winner over the outbreak of the coronavirus uh, in their country and is now helping the world with this medical care. This is a fact. And as it was in the previous session, we have two commenters on the session. It's uh, Dr. Catherine Owen and uh, Anton Bugayenka. So uh, I'm giving the word to Dr. Owen. Please go ahead. You have up to three minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, that was a really comprehensive uh, and a very, very interesting speech, Timur. Thank you very much. Um, I guess I have sort of three, maybe uh, three and a half points uh, I'd like to make. Um, I guess my overall feeling of whether um, Chinese soft power or attitudes towards China is uh, improving or, or worsening, my, my, my overarching feeling is that as with anything, I think it will um, intensify um, and confirm pre-existing opinions about China. So if you think that, um, you know, China is a malevolent force in the world, you're probably even more likely to think that after coronavirus. If you are broadly supportive of the China model, then you're probably even more likely to do so after uh, the virus. Um, so, yeah, um, I think what's quite interesting, I mean, I, I work in higher education and um, there is uh, some interesting uh, opinions coming out about international student recruitment. Uh, and I think certainly uh, in the short term, we'll probably see China winning on that front, uh, given the, the, the fact that many uh, universities uh, in the West won't be able to physically accept students um, in the foreseeable, or at least certainly uh, in September. Uh, and the, arguably China's um, sort of uh, positive handling, relatively positive handling of, of the virus means it's safer perhaps to study there. So that's, uh, I think, one uh, important uh, factor to consider. Um, I also think that the, what has worked well in the Chinese, Chinese case, I, I work on local governance um, in relation to, to, to Eurasia and including China, um, is actually China's system of grassroots governance. So this kind of, you know, a social welfare that's organized through the, like the, the street level, through the local residence committees, and we really see these, there's this very grassroots kind of social aid networks really coming to the fore in China's successful handling uh, of the virus. And I think that is something that could potentially be seen as a, as a, as a model for replication uh, for countries within uh, China's sphere of influence. And then finally, just my third point uh, is um, something that I, uh, I didn't hear you mention, Timur, maybe you did and I just uh, didn't hear it, is this uh, so-called health silk road, uh, which I think is supposed to be, you know, one of uh, sort of China's sort of health diplomacy initiatives. I mean, this predated COVID-19, um, but what it is exactly, I'm not entirely sure. Maybe uh, somebody else has a, has a bit of a better idea. Is it a, um, just an umbrella term for China, Chinese health related foreign aid? Um, or is it um, a kind of more sort of, you know, based on more on sort of cross-pollination, mutual R&D? Um, so um, yeah, I do think perhaps maybe we need to have a bit of a discussion when we're thinking about soft power uh, in uh, relation to coronavirus, what this uh, health silk road uh, is actually going to be about. Thank you, Dr. Owen. Uh, so the, our last commenter is uh, Anton Bugayenka. Anton, please go ahead. You have uh, up to three minutes. Please try to fit in this time and then we will go to the question and answer session. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, no. Um, I will start um, from that. I very agree that this, um, um, from what I see now in uh, our public opinion, uh, that this chi uh, Chinese image, uh, it's on the one hand, it's an improve from for some people, and for some people, it's getting worse. So it's uh, it's actually that's right because uh, because uh, that's improving. Improving it comes from uh, how Timur said that it's a responsible power Chinese cultivate this, this in our own propaganda and sharing this in now in very active sharing in Central Asia and some of people um, start to believe it and um, and, uh, it, 
and actually these people usually is uh, like like very like an iron hand and like an, like some uh, very strong methods what china used to uh, to solve the problem with coronavirus and uh, here was, i also rem uh, remind this uh, that's about umbrella or it will be uh, more than umbrella i mean about be right project i think that it's uh, now it looks more like umbrella but uh, in the future, uh, after this crisis, especially this crisis, maybe the, is the, will start this point. It start to be the, uh, the let be right more than umbrella project, uh, uh, more than umbrella of uh, uh, finance projects, uh, and there, uh, there we will see uh, some. And uh, actually, it came not from um, like. Uh, Central Asian people start to thinking about China and start learning Chinese not, but uh, this coronavirus will change economic situation. And uh, before um, Central Asian countries will uh, concentrate on a Western uh, civilization, on like from through Russia to Western civilization. Of course, this connection with Russia still. Uh, will go on, but their connection with China, um, starting from economy, and uh, as uh, uh, we all uh, know, here the soft, uh, Chinese soft power in Central Asia, it's more about sticky power, um, but sticky in not, uh, not in a bad uh, thinking, but it's uh, like, uh, Mm, it's economic. It's um, more related to economic things. Uh, people uh, would like to connect with China and China as a, a growing market, as a, like our new goal. Um, so we, we'll uh, let us start to pay attention on Chinese uh, Chinese public. Uh, too, uh, as we see now from uh, the story with article uh, was published in Chinese uh, website, and uh, after our foreign ministry uh, had a talks with uh, Ch Chinese ambassador. Uh, so here, okay, let's come to Chinese. Uh, yeah. Chinese you don't on, your time is unfortunately is up. Please last oh, just, 10, uh, just 10, 10, 15 about, seconds. Uh, yes, yes, about uh, just about this current situation uh, of that Chinese diplomats, diplomats kind of attacks. But actually, it's not attacks. I think this is uh, aggressive defense because uh, China now feels very vulnerable. And uh, they, uh, before they didn't start this in Central Asia because United States and, and China actually didn't pay very big attention on the Central Asia in information uh, side. But after the f uh, the first uh, things happen, it's uh, Pompeo visits and published of uh, Central uh, Asian strategy. And in the same time, this was uh, this was a starting of coronavirus and starting of competition in a world side. Uh, and after this, uh, it um, this world uh, like um, from high levels uh, competitions come to the Central Asia, and here we also start in a new uh, like information war. And China at that time feels very vulnerable and start to aggressive defense at that time. So it's mm -hmm. uh, all my comments on this topic. Mm -hmm. Thank now. you. Thank you, dear Anton. Uh, so, uh, dear colleagues, uh, this, uh, this was the last comment of the, our uh, session, uh, fourth session, the final session. So I propose to now uh, move to the uh, questions and ask answers session, the, the most inter inter interesting part where the other uh, listeners can ask questions to our speakers so we already have a bunch of uh, questions i'll take them from here from our chat uh, in zoom and from the live uh, from the facebook and try to voice myself as well as uh, nargiza will help me so uh, dear speakers the uh, the commenters i kindly ask you to try to answer these questions uh, uh, shortly and clearly since we try to cover the most of the questions so uh, the first question is from uh, miss jasmine gut uh, i'd like to ask a question to roman you mentioned that the central asian countries have to act on their own for a moment because of covid covid 19 firstly uh, uh, have there been initiatives of Central Asian countries before the coronavirus, corona crisis? 
where they try to address the issues related to BRI together. And based on, the, on that question, secondly, do you see currently signs of a closer collaboration between Central Asian countries? Thanks. Further, I will uh, uh, translate these questions. I'll put them into, into our chat so you can see them. Thank you. Okay, thank Amal. you very much yeah, for this uh, very good question. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, yes, I still believe that for the moment and uh, for some time after the pandemic, it's very likely that Central Asia will be uh, um, left on its own in terms of um, how to react to the crisis. Uh, of course, there might be some international uh, donor assistance coming to different countries, but I think strategically and geopolitically, countries will need to uh, <clears throat> unite more together. And probably this crisis also presents an opportunity for the countries to really start to promote uh, regional ties at a more even aggressive level than it was. And I think that the fact that there have been a lot of uh, um, growing cooperation recently uh, after some uh, political changes in Uzbekistan, I think this lays very good foundation for actually accelerating the path towards more regional cooperation and also possibly uh, integration. And I must say that I'm not really uh, familiar with, with any of the existing uh, uh, regional platforms uh, that would bring all the countries together to discuss the issues related to the joint implementation of the Belt and Road projects. And I think this is, uh, this is a very important considering how uh, big economically and in terms of the infrastructure this project is. Because I mean, in many ways, uh, Chinese projects uh, are bringing new, let's say, winners and losers to the region in terms of, uh, here I'm talking about the economic actors. And in many ways, this the Chinese projects, they change the local uh, infrastructure and the whole uh, development dynamics. So you really need to have one shared voice and some cooperation on this issue uh, together. So I'm not really familiar, and this is something, again, I'd like to stress that would be very helpful to maximize uh, all the uh, economic as well as uh, uh, strategic e effects from the, uh, this new infrastructure project. Uh, and, uh, Actually, so far after right after the crisis, I haven't seen much of the um, regional uh, uh, cooperation or discussion of the common solutions. But I think this is this will come soon. I'm pretty sure that after some ease of the measures in each country, uh, I'm pretty sure that there'll be a need to you know to restore some of the uh, broken supply chain and some of the channels of cooperation between the countries. So I, I really expect this uh, this this is coming and quite soon. Thank you, Roman. Uh, Nargiza, do we have another question? Yes, we have another question from Zarina uh, to Mr. Arne. Uh, so, uh, what about the technical implementation of the infrastructure projects in Central Asia, which are being built by Chinese companies, workers? Uh, will the COVID have an impact on the perception of Chinese workers? Yeah, Mr. Arne. Hello. Yes, I uh, I actually alluded to that uh, earlier in my comment, but I can go through that again. First of all, uh, the technical impl impact, there will be an impact on the projects where, first of all, the companies that have been running the infrastructure projects, if they have collapsed, gone bankrupt, or if they've lost a uh, number of workers, the, the economies are in lockdown. So the, there will be a stop in a range of projects, and that'll take maybe a half year, a year, or two years for projects to resume. A few projects might even not resume. That can also happen. But in general, many projects will resume with potentially new companies if the existing companies that were implementing them have collapsed or have gone into bankruptcies or so big challenges that they actually have to, have to scale back. Uh, secondly, I also think that, yes, in some instances, there might be an influence and change in perception of towards Chinese workers uh, because of uh, the COVID-19. But again, in, in Western China, there have been at least what the numbers indicate, very rather few cases of COVID-19 in the Xinjiang province. Um, but, but again, there might, of course, be some public perceptions. And we see this influence of social media. And uh, so, yes, in some instances, there might, that might happen. But in general, the overarching trend, I do not think that it will influence and, let's say, stop uh, major projects from continuing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arne, Mr. Arne. So the next question goes to Dr. Owen. Uh, 
Uh, here's the question. What can we expect to see in China's uh, next five-year plan? The, four, the, 40, the 14th four-year plan, 21, uh, uh, 2021, 2025. Any focus on Central Asia specifically, especially given the U.S. unclear strategy to Central Asia? Maybe you, you, have, you can share your ideas. Okay, um, it's a good question. Um, I wouldn't like to say anything too, too concretely. I'm not entirely sure, but I guess um, um, my feeling is that um, Chinese, uh, Chinese, the Chinese approach to Central Asia is very much at the margins of uh, China's overall uh, foreign policy. Um, China's much more interested in, uh, obviously, South China Sea issue, Asia Pacific, uh, countering growing, uh, well, previously growing uh, US uh, influence there. Uh, and now obviously focusing on, on, on um, as we've discussed, managing its uh, international image uh, regarding, uh, I suppose, the major world players. So I do feel that Central Asia will probably take even more of a backseat in the, in the near term uh, than, it, than it has hitherto, which has already been uh, quite marginal. Um, uh, of course, I could be wrong and um, it'll be interesting to hear what other people think about that question. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, our next question is to everybody. Question from senior research fellow at Kazis. Uh, countries have closed the borders and trying to satisfy internal uh, demand in food. Could you please describe how the COVID-19 shape uh, prospects of food and uh, security issues in Central Asia? Should the policymakers review the way how the food chain logistics are organized? Who wants to answer? Maybe Raman Rakurchuk? Well, um, I can be brief on that, and it's a very important question, the impact on the uh, food chains. Well, I've came across the uh, international report on this issue uh, where uh, the findings are quite interesting so far is that the, the food industry, global food industry, hasn't had a much of an impact uh, because of the crisis compared to other industries. Of course, there are some, uh, some issues, but there's still a trade and um, most of the important supply channels, they have not been interrupted, also because they are very strategically important for most of the countries. And I think that for Central Asia, this is probably uh, also the case that you still have, uh, you haven't really reached this, uh, um, the peak of the situation where we under undersupply. Um, and I think that, well, there, there is, uh, of course, there's a big focus on uh, keeping them functioning. But uh, what we also observe at the same time is that uh, there's a risk, there's a growing risk of uh, the, especially in the rural areas in most of the Central Asian countries, uh, especially with the uh, poor households who have very uh, limited funding that actually has been cut because of the crisis. And this also relates to the families uh, who have uh, their, for example, husbands working as labor migrants in Russia. They're in a, a very difficult situation and the situation is actually getting worse uh, day by day. Uh, I think they, they have quite a number of different food security issues and probably this is, should be the main, uh, one of the main, uh, I would say, uh, goals for the government to really to, to tackle, to actually to try to uh, help the most uh, vulnerable uh, layers of the society in all countries. Uh, trying to really help them and uh, prioritize them in terms of providing assistance and uh, also social uh, services. Uh, but in terms of the original trade patterns, I think that uh, they're still there and uh, I haven't seen much, although, although of course trade with China has been declining, for example, by I think by 15% or so, by some estimates. But I think some of the most critical food supply chains, they have not been uh, much interrupted. Thank you, dear Roman. So uh, we have the question from the Elira Trudubaiva from AECA in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so here is the question. What do you think about the Chinese surveillance in Central Asia? Chinese technology companies have deployed FRCs, face recognition cameras in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. And the data from these FRCs have been shared with China. So guys, who, who, who wants to answer this question? Uh, maybe Timur, Maybe Timur, you would like to answer? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, very good question. Um, here I want to say that um, it is not quite... Uh, I'm not sure that the data of uh, people, personal information and um, 
everything else is shared. I'm not sure that uh, it is the fact that those data, those information are shared with China, um, but there is a risk because um, the companies that provide those services for Central Asian countries are Chinese. Um, in Kyrgyzstan, by the way, um, the company that built uh, the network of surveillance cameras is um, Russian, um, but the operational system that they're working on is Chinese. Um, and I don't uh, think that um, right now those uh, surveillance systems are on the level, on the such level that uh, they collect um, very um, personal information at, at this moment. But in the future, there is a risk of course, of um, leakage of information. But here we come to, you know, the um, dilemma uh, to whom we trust more. Um, do we uh, trust big companies like Facebook or Google who collect um, a lot more information than uh, surveillance cameras? And um, do we trust them or do we um trust our governments do we trust um our own smartphones um it, it is a very deep philosophical question i guess thank you so much uh, the next question is uh, from jasmine uh, i would like to ask a question to raman uh, you mentioned that central asia countries have to act on their own for a moment because of covid Firstly, have there been initiative, initiatives of Central Asia countries before the corona crisis? Uh, were they tired, tried um, to address issues related to the BRI together? Uh, Na and, Nagisa, uh, uh, I, I, think, I think I have addressed this question a little bit oh. earlier. I'm sorry, because we have too, much, uh, too, too many questions. Sorry. Um, maybe we can address the another question. Uh, from Kusan Boy uh, Mamadolimov uh, to Anton. Uh, uh, can you please elaborate how this uh, strengthened focus in tactical and ideological level is likely to take place? Anton? Yes, um, so uh, about focuses, um, now it's very hard to say because situation is, is still growing. I mean, uh, now it's we don't know who, who wins in this big competition, China or United States. I think the boss uh, will lose <laughs> something. Uh, so, and but in the end, we'll see China, uh, Central Asian uh, states will move to some like a Chinese sphere. Uh, it's not like in Cold War area. Era, but uh, it uh, seems to be uh, as I um, I remember what when uh, where I said about focuses I said uh, uh, about uh, the to take an investment so. Um, if before uh, Chinese uh, uh, before Chinese. Uh, Chinese uh, officials uh, usually give the money to our states, our governments, uh, you know, uh, with uh, just like recommendations. Not, not. Uh, it's not recommendations. After uh, China, after Central Asian states governments uh, set uh, this. Um, like pro officials uh, vision on Chinese foreign policy, uh, but before it was just declarate, and at now we'll we will see this more like um, to to waiting to to waiting uh, Chinese uh, officials will wait for um, not only declarations but also like moving on to Chinese stage, um, but. Uh, I also can uh, I also can't say this clearly now because um, situation is still growing on. So maybe we'll see it later when uh, China when the situation stabilized and Chinese economy, uh, uh, yes, economy and the state uh, in China will stabilize and um, we'll see new goals of uh, China's foreign policy. Okay, so the next next question is to Dr. Owen. Uh, 
I agree that uh, the state capacity matters irrespective of democratic or authoritarian regime, but democracy is not only about the state capacity, but also about society and its political culture and resilience mechanisms, which at the end of the day are rooted in traditional culture. Do you think that we need to revisit social contract between state and society after the COVID? Do you see it as a feasible? If so, in which regions, countries of the world? Thank you. Uh, I think it's a, a really interesting question. Um, I think probably in all, all countries, all regions of the world, there will be a, some sort of soul searching as to, um, you know, what could have been managed better and how the state society uh, balance really sort of worked out under the pandemic. Um, and, oh, can you, can you still hear me? Someone's just get, shared their screen. Um, okay, I'll just continue. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think the, the pandemic has really thrown into uh, into relief uh, the weak spots in, in every social contract, regardless of democratic or uh, authoritarian. Um, I think, uh, for example, in the UK, um, we've seen nearly a million, a million volunteers signing up uh, to help our national health service. Uh, but we've not given any tasks really to do. So there's, there's been this huge ground, sort of people wanting to get active and not really knowing how. Uh, I think in China, people have really been um, questioning, you know, the, the state censorship of the narrative that was culminating, of course, in, in um, uh, 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 Li Wenliang's uh, death towards the beginning. So I think, um, yeah, every, every country will probably have this internal uh, debate about what could have been done better and what it says about state society relations. Thank you so much. And we have uh, the next question from Mark David Miller. Great panel and discussions. Uh, uh, two questions. Uh, can the local countries be expected to participate more in items of labor, both managers and workers, because of pressures on the uh, Chinese labor market? And can BRI become more open and cooperative with more Western multilateral and government uh, development agencies? BRI puts uh, Central Asia on uh, radar for development. Uh, uh, ADB and lots of other groups are interested in the region, but BRI is doing a larger investment. If there can be better coordination and cooperation, then all countries would benefit. Uh, question to everybody. Maybe Mr. Arne wants to answer. I think that in the instances where there are local workers who can work on projects, absolutely, and where there are technical skills, absolutely, there will be local capacity. Uh, in large part, the reason for why a lot of Chinese workers have been joining projects across Asia and also in Africa is because on a lot of the projects, they need technical skills to actually pr to develop the infrastructure projects. That is the main reason, but also because of a lack of uh, workers that are actually able to contribute and work on the specific projects. There are also linguistic issues sometimes, but that is not so much a, a, a main reason, but in some instances that can also be the fact. Um, whether or not uh, international organizations uh, such as the ADB, ERD, EBRD, etc. will be joining. In some projects, yes, potentially. Um, but I think what is important to consider here is also uh, some other questions which were raised earlier, and I'd just like to comment on that, is yes, China will need to rebuild its economy after the COVID-19 pandemic, for sure. But that does not mean that China is also going to continue on the One Belt, One Road strategy. Because some people may think that, oh, just because of COVID-19, they will stop and not longer focus on that. I don't think that's the case. So we need to be able to have two thoughts in the head at the same time. China will focus on rebuilding its economy, no question, but they will also continue on the One Belt, One Road strategy because that is also two strategies. We must remember One Road is the maritime strategy because currently seven of the 10 largest ports in the world are in Eastern China. That's a very important point. Therefore, they need to develop the maritime capacity across the Indian Ocean, across the Persian Gulf, the Mediterranean, etc. They want to also develop ports and terminals. Secondly, the One Belt strategy is basically to connect Western China with Central Asia, the Middle East, Russia, South Asia, and Europe, because Western China is much less developed than Eastern China. And Western China 
populate there are 300 million people living there uh, i traveled personally from shanghai to istanbul on the on overland i saw it myself and there's a m big need to develop and provide employment for people living in western china and therefore this was a strategy uh, developed by by beijing initially um also to Catherine's question about the health silk road and i think this is an important uh, question uh, which Catherine raised which was also presented by china in many ways i think the health silk road is already in operation we are seeing china providing medical supplies to countries worldwide and why because china is really the only country that has the manufacturing capacity it has china has become an industrial superpower and a manufacturing superpower and it provides massive amounts of medical supplies now to countries worldwide in addition what is going to be one major implication of the covid 19 pandemic is that a lot of countries are going to want to develop their own national manufacturing capacity to develop health supplies etc in order in order to do that a lot of countries will need the support of china because china has the technical know-how they have the turnkey solutions to provide from the design state to the delivery of the final project and therefore i think i think china is going to be contributing massively and also adapt its bri strategy to the needs of the post covid 19 world thank you can you hear me so the last question uh because uh we are a little bit out of time uh could uh, xinjiang crisis with muslim minorities affect the bri project now or in future who would like to answer this question uh roman uh, maybe you or someone else i'm not really expert in this area uh, I think maybe anton, no? anton, anton maybe anton or anton Anton or okay, um, Timur? Um, I tried to answer it. Um, when I said about this new focuses of China's policy, I uh, didn't say this, but I thinking about this. Maybe it's like this problem. Uh, but um, here will be uh, the more important it's uh, economic growing. So, um, if uh, if in Chinese Xinjiang, um, Chinese government will grow um, the region economy, um, I think this problem of Muslims um, will be not uh, will be not grow because um, Chinese uh, because Chinese. Uh, uh, because uh, this uh, ch Muslims in Xinjiang um, will be in uh, in corporate in the uh, like in the Chinese uh, uh, the new Chinese economy. That's where, where uh, we all said this about uh, after COVID uh, after this uh, crisis, Chinese economy will be more isolated. It means this uh, economy will concentrate on its own market and uh, concentrate on a market needs more resources and needs more resources it should be um, it should be um, uh, developed to uh, the before undeveloped uh, regions including uh, Xinjiang so uh, and give uh, and I think this China will give more money more uh, to more finance resources to uh, to, to develop uh, Xinjiang and uh, I think the main questions is uh, here uh, so if we talk about this uh, like um, how public opinion in Central Asians uh, look to Central uh, to Xinjiang problem mm, the, uh, it's uh, also uh, will be uh, according to uh, how is uh, Central Asian states uh, governments uh, will sta uh, stabilize because uh, now we have uh, mineral resources price problem is falling down and uh, our states don't have uh, a, cur a currency to uh, to make a good uh, social situation in our state and if uh, we don't have uh, money to uh to make our social situations uh be uh better uh be uh, s still as good as before 
um, yeah, uh, uh, still as before. Uh, so uh, there's some uh, interiors uh, in interiors policy or so some oppositions, some parts of elites can use uh, this uh, Muslims problem in Xinjiang uh, in interiors policies deals and it will be uh, a very a very uh, very big issue for China for China's growing in Central Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Thank you very much. Uh, one more comment, and uh, I think we, we can finalize. Uh, there is a comment that uh, one thing has one thing has been missed on, in today's panel. But, it's uh, sorry, a, I a, I, I, B. Yeah. Uh, I hope in the future we can hear ex, uh, experts' opinions on the change of AIIB strategy after the COVID, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, sorry, we missed that part. So um, the time is running now, and uh, I would like to give a floor to uh, to our uh, executive director of IWPR, Mr. Anthony Borden, for a short uh, speech. Mr. Thank Borden. you, uh, Ermac. Uh, I'm Tony. I'm in London, and I get the ridiculous honor of um, closing out simply by having had the uh, great pleasure to listen and to extend thanks to everybody. Uh, I could say that um, Abahan has been on my case for some time now for the failure to visit uh, Central Asia in, in some time, and I'm heartbroken that because of recent events, that trip has been delayed. But if anything is the closest uh, approximation that you could get of the discussion and the richness of the issues, and of course the breadth of participants and the people listening that we have, to visit, it would be this uh, amazing Zoom conference. So I want to, um, first of all, thank the many speakers, Catherine, Arne, Roman, Temor, and Anton. You really gave us a great tour of the issues and the challenges, and, and I'm sure you underlined for us the great importance of being aware and, and opening our minds and thinking freshly about the challenges that we face, especially for such a strategically important region as Central Asia. I want to congratulate Ermac and Nargiza, who I think did a spectacular job to coordinate this so efficiently, professionally, and cordially. And of course, thank Abahan and Kabar Asia and the RPR team who are behind all this. And I hope you see this represents so much of our work. We're really pleased to have Nupi and other partners, but above all, our participating analysts and young reporters and experts. And we really hope and believe you've given them a great perspective and some fresh uh, thoughts. Um, I certainly want to thank, uh, in closing, our very dear friends at the Norwegian Foreign Ministry. You know, not only are they generous uh, friends of Adam PR, but they've demonstrated a really long-term and strategic commitment to supporting uh, uh, Central Asia. And I think this is just something to be really applauded. And, 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 and of course, we're grateful, but we can see the benefits and the importance of this now to, to, to have a confirmed and, and consistent strategic approach. Um, we really would appreciate your feedback. I'm sure the team would love to hear from you. Um, this is uh, very exciting. It's all new. So we'd like to hear what you think. Uh, follow uh, the Kabar uh, website and our outputs and our programming. And we hope to be in touch and communicate with you more. Um, the only last thing I'd like to try, I don't know if it's possible, but are we able to thank our, uh, does it work on Zoom if we can thank all our participants by putting our hands together virtually? Maybe we could see if that works. If thank I you so much, uh, dear Anthony, for your uh, such a great speech. Uh, so uh, finally, we should end our online meeting. Dear participants, in case of additional questions, you can contact our members and write them emails. Dear colleagues, thank you for your hard work. We've had a fruitful discussion on today's topic uh, and hope our event will contribute uh, to further uh, research. A live recording of the event is available on the Kabar Facebook page. Highlights of the meeting will be posted to the Kabar website in the near future for those wishing to learn more about the event. Thank you so much. Uh, please stay safe and uh, have a nice evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your valuable reports and um, bless you. Take care. Bye-bye to everybody.
Thank you very much. Goodbye.